The one other element that Mark's brief story has is the wild animals in the desert, clearly a danger to Jesus, but he is not harmed by them. And of course, that is reminiscent of Daniel in the lion's den when the angels came and closed up the mouths of the lions. Mark is writing this in order to say, this person is God. This Jesus of Nazareth, about whom you have heard all these stories, he is one and the same with the Creator God that you have known all your lives. The same God whose spirit moved across the face of the waters in the first chapter of Genesis moves across the face of the Jordan River as a dove in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. But why is Mark asserting this? Why is he saying this person is the embodiment of God in this world? And it's for this simple reason. People need to know who God is. People need to know what God is like. And if we don't know what God is like, then our faith is empty and we end up just saying, well, I believe in God. But what does that mean if you don't know what God is like? So Mark is saying, and Mark is surrounded by a group of like-minded people, he says, look at this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Listen to the things that I'm going to tell you about him. This is what God is like. This is who God is. And a certain group of people agreed with Mark and said, yes, this is the nature of God revealed in a human being. Many other people, of course, said, no, that is not what God is like. This man is not God. Now we come to the question, what did Mark say about Jesus that made him think that Jesus was God? Or what did Jesus do in his life that Mark and many others afterwards would look at the stories of his life and say, yes, this is what God is. And Mark answers that question very easily and neatly for us. He puts all of the answers about God right in that very first chapter of his gospel. In less than a half a page of normal writing, Mark says, this is what Jesus did. I say, this is God. And these are the things that he said in Mark 1, verses 14 to 20. Jesus calls four disciples to him. James and John, Simon and Andrew. All of them fishermen. So the first thing that Mark is saying about the God of the universe is this. The God of the universe calls common, ordinary into his service. I've talked to you before about the disciples and who they were. They were likely people about 18 or 19 years of age, people who had been rejected by other rabbis because they were not good prospects to become leaders themselves. They were not academics, they were not intellectual, they did not belong to powerful families. James and John and Simon and Andrew had been rejected. And now as bright old men at the age of 19, their lives were set for them. But Mark says this, the God of the universe comes to common people whom others would have rejected and says, come into my service. That's who God is. The second thing that Mark says in that very brief first chapter is this. From verses 21 to 28, he tells the story of a man with an evil spirit whom Jesus heals. And in the mindset of those people, well, we don't fully understand what it is to have an evil spirit. But we have this sense that the man with the evil spirit had within him thoughts and attitudes 
that were destructive of himself and the people around him. He was changed by Jesus. So Mark is saying, God is the God who can go to any person and change what they are. And that's good news for us. Because all of us know that we have within us something that is corrupt and evil. We all want to change. When we come into the new year, we make great plans to change who we are. And Mark says, God is able to change us. In verses 29 to 34, still within the first chapter, Jesus goes out and begins healing people. And even though there are not specific stories of healing in these few verses, what Mark says is this, Jesus healed many people and cast out many demons. And so Mark is saying it is the will of God that many will be healed and restored and helped. The next thing in verses 35 to 39, when Jesus has finished his healing ministry in that small village where they are now located, he says to his disciples, we're not done. We have to go away from here and move away from these little towns of Bethsaida and Capernaum and Chorazin. We must go throughout all of Judea and tell people about God's love and heal people wherever we go. And so Mark says, God's love is for everyone. In verses 40 to 45, we have one more specific healing. This is the last little story in that first chapter. It is the healing of a leper. And of course, the leper represents that person <coughs> who is being punished by God because he was sinful. But when Jesus lifts the leprosy from that man, he proclaims to all the people, leprosy or any disease is not God's punishment for sin. God loves all people equal. So what Mark is saying in this little story of the dove descending upon Jesus is this. This man is what God is like. And what God is like is this. God is in touch with common people. God connects to those common people. God is able to change people no matter who they are. God is compassionate. God feels the hurt and the anguish of all people, whether they are grieving or sick or disappointed or outcast. God is compassionate. Then he says, every person matters to God. Every human being is important in the sight and in the plan of your God. And finally, God is forgiving and gracious and merciful. What a compact message Mark puts into that one single chapter of scripture. But even though it's a compact message, it was a contentious and difficult message for the people of his day to hear because they did not all believe those things. That God connects to common people, that God can change people, that God is compassionate, that every person counts, that everyone is forgiven. They were difficult ideas for the people of that age. But a certain group of people looked at those stories about Jesus in about the year 70 AD and they said, yes, this is who God is. This is what G God is like, fully revealed in the stories about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. 